And I'm really happy to be here to talk to you all about COVID-19 and what's going on in our regions here in the Midwest. I wish we were talking about something um, more, not more exciting because there can't be much more excitement than what we have right now, but more uplifting. So we are still in the surge. And we see that across our state, we see that across the Midwest, but it seems to be in a steady state. Now you could say, well, that's good, but we wish we would turn the corner and see a decrease in test positivity rates and in the number of individuals in our hospitals. Over the Thanksgiving long weekend, we did, we did see a decrease in the number of tests but there were still 477 individuals that newly tested positive for COVID-19 in our region here in the Midwest. So that's still a lot of people that got COVID-19. What we have seen is that the positivity rates for our regions where Mayo Clinic has their hospitals and their clinics, we have seen this pretty much level off here in Rochester, we're around 10%. Throughout the Mayo Health System, it's in the lower 20%, so maybe a little tick up. We thought we were seeing it come down, but a little bit of a tick up in percent positivity. And in Southwest Wisconsin, we've actually seen, no, excuse me, Southeast Wisconsin, we've actually in Southwest Wisconsin, sorry about that, we've actually seen a significant increase to almost 25% positivity. When you think about it, this is pretty significant across the board because our goal is to be less than 10% and even less than 5%. And that would tell us that our environment is getting safer. What about staff absences? This has been huge across the country, making sure that we have enough staff to care for individuals with COVID-19 and those that need medical care that don't have COVID-19. Well, we have seen a decrease, a continued decrease in the percentage of our staff that are out of work because they either have COVID-19 or for COVID-19 reasons. This has come down to just 2.2% of our staff. Now, knowing that we have 55 thousand staff here in the Midwest. It's still a good number of individuals that are affected by COVID-19, but we are able to staff our facilities, which is very, very important. What about patient numbers? What's going on there? Well, on Monday at two o'clock in the afternoon, so yesterday, we had around 300 individuals in our facilities, in our hospitals with COVID-19. This doesn't include the hundreds of individuals that we are following in the outpatient setting who don't need hospitalization. In Rochester today, we had 105, we have 105 individuals with COVID-19 in our hospital with 31 in the ICU. Yesterday, we had 110 with 34 in the ICU. So it seems that we are sort of in the mid 90 to lower hundreds, the number of individuals with COVID-19 in our Rochester hospital. Across the Midwest, we are also seeing a bit of a, a steady state. In Northwest Wisconsin, 85 patients are hospitalized, 10 in the ICU. In Southeast Minnesota, 16 patients hospitalized with five in the ICU. In Southwest Minnesota, 51 patients hospitalized with six in the ICU. And Southwest Wisconsin, 28 individuals with COVID-19 hospitalized with four in the ICU. Now the good thing is, many individuals are being dismissed from our hospitals and that means that they are surviving. And to me, that's lives saved. And that's the bottom line. That's our goal. And here in the Midwest for the Mayo Clinic, we have had 2,296 individuals whose lives have been saved and they left our hospital. So that's wonderful. And that's what we want to do. That's what we want to keep doing is save lives and help individuals. In order to do that, as you've heard me say in the past, we need three things. We need staff, 
we need supplies and we need space or beds. And so we continue every day to look at what our needs are to care for individuals with COVID-19, either in the hospital or in the outpatient setting, or the, and those in our communities who don't have COVID-19. And right now, things look good. We look and to see how many beds we need in the inpatient setting. And that's when we determine, do we need to decrease the number of surgeries we do each day? And each surgery is reviewed individually by a number of people to decide, can this person have their surgery delayed for a day or two, a week or two, depending. And if they can't, they have surgery. If they do, if they can wait a day or so, then we delay their surgery or we list them or schedule them for surgery for a week out. This means that we will be able, to, we continue to do surgery. We are only limiting those surgeries that the individual in the perioperative period would need an intensive care unit bed. So it's still safe to seek medical care at medical institutions. Don't wait and, until you are really, really sick to, to seek medical care. It is safe. Our outpatient practices are still seeing patients in a safe environment and our emergency rooms are safe. So if, you, if an individual has a chronic disease that seems to be getting worse or a new symptom, please seek medical care as needed. Don't delay that. We saw this back in the spring, in March and April, when we first started all of this COVID-19 management. And what we saw were when people did show up in our emergency rooms, they were a lot sicker than they, than they would have been and needed more care than they would have needed if they would have come earlier. We're starting to see some of that now. Naturally, over the holiday weekend, visits to the emergency rooms go down. But even before that, seeing visits to the emergency rooms go down for non-COVID reasons. And it makes us worried that people are delaying their own health care that is needed. So we urge people to get the health care that they're needed. Now, we also have new weapons to treat COVID-19, which are absolutely spectacular. We have remdesivir, which is an antiviral that, we, that needs to be started in the hospital, but then when someone is dismissed from the hospital, they can have the rest of their treatments, which are just infusions, and complete that in the outpatient setting. That is a wonderful medication. The other are the monoclonal antibodies. And we started this over a week ago, and so far we have infused 340 individuals. That is amazing. And what this antibody does is it decreases the severity of disease and decreases the risk for hospitalization. So who's eligible for this? It is anybody who has COVID-19 and they are at risk of having a poor outcome or needing hospitalization. So that would be anybody over the age of 65, an individual who is obese, an individual with chronic lung disease, heart disease, those sorts of ailments that may, that would put them at higher risk for having a poor outcome with COVID-19. Now, the trick is, is that the time to get these monoclonal antibodies is early in the disease. So as soon as you test positive, as soon as you have symptoms. There's a 10-day window, and that's when the magic happens. If you wait too late, it's too late to have the monoclonal antibody. It will not do as much good. Many people, when we call every day, every single person that has tested positive in our system is reviewed to see if they qualify for monoclonal antibodies. And if they do, they are called and the there's a discussion about the infusion. It does not interact with any medications. It does not, it is not eliminate, eliminated by the kidney or the liver. So you don't need to worry about that. But many people say, oh, I feel well. Yes, I'm positive, but give it to somebody who isn't doing as well as I am. 
unfortunately, those individuals are going to miss that window of when the monoclonal antibodies are the most effective. So think about this. If you test positive, even call your primary care doctor to see if you are eligible for monoclonal antibodies. It really is helping keep people out of the hospital and decrease the severity of the disease. Now, the other new weapon that we have or will be having soon are the vaccinations. The vaccines for COVID-19, we are anxiously awaiting them. It's the two that already have emergency use authorization, Pfizer and Moderna. These are ones that they're very similar. They're mRNA based. They are, you get two doses. So you get your initial dose and then a booster, either 21 or 28 days afterwards. And we are looking very forward to having these vaccines across our system here in the Midwest and many, many institutions across the United States already have their processes down pat so that as soon as we get the vaccines, we can start administering them. Now, the triage or the tiers of individuals who qualify for the vaccines are being determined nationally by experts and then, by, and then fine tuned at the state level. But at this point, it appears that those that will be in the first wave will be healthcare workers who have direct contact with COVID-19 patients. So those who are working in the COVID-19 wards, those in the emergency room, the EMS workers, those in long-term facilities who are working there, and also those who work in the morgue. They are at high risk of exposure to COVID-19. And then it will again come to those individuals who are at high risk for poor outcomes. We are going to get waves of these vaccines and we will continue to administer them as quickly as we get them. Because even though I wouldn't say that there are magic bullets, this is certainly going to help and um, help decrease hospitalizations, decrease severity of the disease, decrease the surge. Very, very important. And speaking of the surge, I just want to first uh, say that I hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving and a very safe Thanksgiving. If you feel that your Thanksgiving wasn't as safe as it should have been, make sure that you know of all the individuals that were at your gathering and that there is some way that you can find out if they have come down with symptoms. If they have, you should get tested even if you're asymptomatic. And stay away from others. Wear a mask, social distance, robust hand hygiene. So if you did contract COVID-19, you are not giving it to others. There are recommendations from the CDC about quarantining. And those recommendations are still not quite solidified. In fact, they're shortening the quarantine days. But the most important thing is that you get notified if somebody that you were with over the holidays comes down with symptoms, you get tested, you keep yourself safe. We know that wearing a mask, if you have COVID-19, wearing a mask is the best way to protect everybody around you. And with that, I think I'll stop and answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Williams. So uh, this comes from Christopher Snowback from the Star Tribune. Has Mayo Clinic developed a home monitoring program that's helping alleviate pressure on your hospitals with technology, letting some COVID patients be cared for at home when they would have been admitted in the spring? If so, do you have any estimate on how many hospitalizations you may have avoided with this program? I don't have the estimation, I don't have the numbers in my head, but we may be, will probably be able to give you those numbers because we have monitored 14,000 individuals in the outpatient setting since the beginning of this pandemic. And we call it the COVID frontline care team. And these are general internists that are, that 
call the patient multiple times a day. Depending on the patient's risk, there is monitoring in the home. And what they do is they intervene as soon as they see that the patient is even starting to decline, which is very important to send an ambulance there if need be, have them go to the emergency room, troubleshoot for the patient. So we have been doing this since the beginning of the pandemic. And it has significantly, it has decreased the burden on our primary caregivers so that they can, they can take care of patients who don't have COVID-19. And we do believe, and I don't have the numbers, that it has decreased emergency room visits for these individuals and decreased hospitalizations. All right, thank you. Um, this question comes from Melanie Evans from the Wall Street Journal. Um, how many transfers are you seeing and from where? Has Mayo needed to deny any transfer requests because of its own capacity constraints? The, the number of transfers depend on what's happening across our region. And yes, we get transfers. We get transfers every day. We certainly get them from within the Mayo Health System, all of our hospitals around the system. We look at our, our total bed capacity, look at the needs of the patient, determine the best place for that patient to go, trying to keep them as close to home as possible. But we've also taken patients in transfer from outside of our state, from outside of our region, depending on the acuity and the needs of that patient. So, on um, yesterday, I believe, we had 11 admissions. I don't know how many transfers, how many of those were transfers, um, but we do keep track of that. So, Melanie, we can follow up with you on that one. And when um, I say 11 admissions, that means just in our, uh, in the Rochester, Rochester Hospital. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. This question comes from Jennifer Bredo. Um, has Mayo needed to add any additional ICU beds since the surge of cases in recent weeks, whether that is in Rochester or across the health system? And if so, how many? Yes, we have. So in Rochester, we added uh, 12 to 13 beds and moved a perioperative area, had it be um, changed it to become a um, an ICU and then move the perioperative area elsewhere. So we have been juggling around so that we can accommodate those patients who need ICU care, whether they are COVID-19 to keep them in those designated areas and expand them by 12 to 13 beds, and also to keep the non-COVID individuals who need ICU or hospital care away from those units to keep them separate. We have also increased the beds in our health system. I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. We have increased beds in the health system. We have uh, done that in numerous places. All right, thank you. And this we've question. also increased the non-ICU beds here in Rochester, and we continue to model that. We have very robust modeling to do, based on the community that the COVID activity in our surrounding counties and even further out, what's going on in the hospitals around us to determine, do we need to in increase our number of non-COVID beds and COVID beds to care for, to care for our community? All right, thank you. Sorry, I started to interrupt there. Um, this comes from Isaac Johns from Rochester. Is Mayo expecting another spike in cases related to Thanksgiving? It's, if so, what, if anything, is being done to prepare for this new spike? Yes, we are expecting it. So we saw a spike after, thank, after, excuse me, after Halloween. We saw it after MEA. We saw this across our state of Minnesota and into Wisconsin. We expect this within, usually it's about one, it's by the end of this week, next week, and the next week that we are going to start seeing the spikes. Because what would happen is if someone is exposed over the holiday, it usually takes, oh, three, five, 10 days before you start having symptoms. During that time, if you're not wearing a mask and social distancing, 
you can spread that virus. And so it's, it's not only the individuals that got infected over the Thanksgiving holiday at gatherings, it is who they then infect after that. So we expect this to last two, three weeks, this next surge. And what are we doing to prepare? Looking at our models, determining how many ICU beds we need, determining how many um, progressive care beds we need, and general medicine and surgery beds we need, and managing to that. So let's say that our model says that we are going to see three times the number, so 300 COVID patients in, one, in our hospital in Rochester. We would then say, all right, we need to decrease this amount of other work or other uh, care in order to save those beds for COVID patients. So we may delay more, more surgeries, more inpatient elective surgeries. We may decrease the number of patients that we see in the outpatient setting per day to move more staff into the hospital to care for patients. So it is nursing staff, physician staff, other allied health staff. So it's a constant management. Every day, all of our hospitals are going through this. There are huddles throughout the day. Where are we now? Where were we earlier in the day and yesterday? What's the trajectory? What do the models show? What do we need to do? This is, has been constant since um, the pandemic started. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Brian, I believe your question was covered. So um, if you disagree with me, let me know. <laughs> this question comes from Laura Grossman. Um, Minnesota is surrounded by states that haven't taken measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Has Minnesota's hospital capacity been affected by the surrounding states and to what extent? And if not, do you will expect that it will become an issue? Well, remember that Mayo Clinic has hospitals in Wisconsin, so that's one of those states. So yes, our capacity in Wisconsin, our hospitals are absolutely stretched. Absolutely. And they have set up new home programs. One is called Advanced Care at Home for individuals that almost need to take that hospital home with them and those resources to care for them, those that can go home for that. We also have seen individuals from North and South Dakota, individuals from Iowa who have needed to be transferred to Minnesota for care. And we do our best to accommodate individuals who need tertiary care, COVID care, non-COVID care, um, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth Schockman asks, what type of surgery are you expecting after Thanksgiving? Do you have a projection for the number or percentage for that spike? Well, we talked today in that um, we, are all, we have only decreased our, right now, our surgical, our elective inpatient surgical volume has just, is just 10% less than it normally is. Because of incredible bed management, hospital patient management, hospital management, and increasing our capacity in our hospital here in Rochester. Our, some of our other sites have needed to more drastically decrease their surgical volumes and even push it out until January, saying that we just can't do elective cases, whatever the percentage, and we are anticipating this is going to last until January. Again, every day we look at this, but we are ready. We have many levers that we can pull so that we can make sure that we have the staffing, the supplies, and the beds to care for patients as we see this spike. 